On this episode, I am thrilled to be joined by a former teammate of mine and an English footballing icon. He played over 700 professional games and won 78 England caps, earning one of the most famous nicknames in football. This is Stuart Pearce, also known as Psycho. Piercy, great to see you. Pleasure, John. We, uh, your story mm. isn't a normal footballing story, so take us back to the start. I was never a, a child superstar like yourself, Joe. Um, finished schooling at the age of 16, played for a really good school team, Champions of London, but had nowhere to go and play my football at the right. age of 16. So I think five of us went down to our local club, which was Wealdstone, who were playing in the Southern League at the time, which was a league just outside the football leagues, and ended up staying there for five years, played 250 games. Yeah. And... You had trials at QPR mm. and you turned down a, a... An opportunity at Hull? Yeah, I think I was 18 at the time and myself and, and the captain at Wealdstone went up to Hull on yeah. a trial game. I was doing an apprenticeship as an yeah. electrician at the time and we played against Grimsby away uh, in a trial match, had about glamour three tie. days. It was a proper glamour, glamour <laughs> tie, you know what I mean? Suited me, Joe, suited <laughs> me. Um, the manager wanted to take both of us. Uh, the captain at the time, he was 27, turned it down because he was earning more money than going in the, f the old fourth division. Right. And it just seemed a long way f from home as an 18-year-old. Yeah. They even offered me a job on uh, Humberside Council to carry on my trade as electrician and be a part-time footballer yeah. on a full-time basis it, up it, there. If you said that story to some of the young players in the academy now, they'd think it was like a parallel universe, wouldn't they? They would. I mean, yeah. to be honest with you, when I turned pro, I carried on tra uh, trading. Yeah. I advertised in the programme and all heard, sorts. I've heard for a couple of years, yeah. so, um, yeah. So you was moonlighting as an electrician? Yeah, whilst... I just, just flipped it, yeah. really, from, from sort of uh, full-time sparks yeah. to, to part-time yeah. footballer and just turned it on its head and went part-time electrician. So eventually mm. when you did get a move to Coventry, you still would have been an anomaly coming into the dressing room. Like you said, a full-time spark and mm. now you're playing for Coventry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I packed my job in on Brent Council I was earning uh, 280 quid a week, yeah. footballer as well as yeah. electrician. And I walked into Bobby Gould's office and he offered me a £30 wage cut to be a, <laughs> a footballer in the top division in the country. <laughs> insane, so insane. I'd already packed my job in, Joe, so yeah. I couldn't go back. Yeah. So I couldn't tell him no, you know, so I've had to take a wage cut to be a pro yeah. footballer. So that's in the why top I flight. On in the top flight, top division in the country. A couple of weeks, I think four weeks after signing, we beat Liverpool at home 4 0 with the, the great Liverpool team. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I'm yeah. thinking, this is just ridiculous, you know what yeah. I mean? I've had to take a wage cut to be part of this, but you had no choice. 1985, Nottingham Forest come calling, mm. the legendary Brian Clough. Originally, when Brian Clough picks the phone up and, and he wants you to come and sign for him, you're signing for him. Yeah. He was probably the biggest character in football. And I would say he's probably the biggest character there's ever been in football, yes. personally. You know, the what he achieved on the pitch with lesser light teams, if you like, with mm. Derby, with Forest and whatever. So so meeting him, you're scared stiff. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's this reputation of a fella there. Um, my first conversations I had with him, I, w I was asked by a coach, I was walking up to, to the ground one day, playing for Coventry. We were yeah. playing Liverpool back end of the season and, and a fella come up alongside me and said, uh, do you want to come and play for Nottingham Forest? I didn't know this fella from Adam. Yeah. And I was walking to the game, you know. Um, it was about an hour and a quarter before the game. And I said, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't mind. My contract was due to finish at the end of that season at Coventry. Uh, and I'd been there 18 months. And I said, yeah. So he said, give us your number. We'll give you a ring. So I've give this total stranger my telephone <laughs> number. It was bizarre when I look back, you know, yeah. how naive I was. Um, a couple of days later, the phone went. It was the same fella who happened to be on the coaching staff yeah. and just said, uh, I've got Brian Clough here, he wants to talk to you. Yeah. So I, I'm nervous as a kid and going on the phone, Joe. Yeah. Picked the phone up and he it, it, it said, uh, Brian Clough, do you <laughs> want to play for me, son? And I went, yeah, I wouldn't mind. And he slammed the phone down. <laughs> that was it. That was the whole conversation. <laughs> and uh, about three months later, he, he come and paid 200 grand for me. You had some League Cup triumphs. Mm. Talk to me about them nights. Because, like you said, from, from the aspect, you, you're playing non-league at Wilston, and all of a sudden you're lifting trophies with Nottingham Forest. Mm. That must have... Did, did there any point that you, you pinched yourself? To be honest with you, I was fortunate enough to, to work for a manager in mm. Brian Clough that kept you really, really grounded. Yeah. You know, my first 
great example of that. My first England call, I was so excited. I yeah. think in, uh, what was it, not 87, I 87. got picked. And Cluffy called me in the following day and said, uh, I see you're in the England squad, son. And mm. I said, that's right. He said, do you think you're good enough? I said, I'm not sure. He went, I don't, get out. <laughs> and I'm his captain at the time, you know? And, yeah. and it was his way of just keeping me level yeah. and saying, hey, we pay your wages, keep your feet on the ground. But great motivation for yeah, me, Joe, because yeah. I thought the nerves I had of playing for England, I had someone to prove wrong. Yeah, and I yeah, think yeah, in, in yeah, life, yeah. if you've got someone to say, I oh, can prove you wrong. Yeah. You had a love-hate relationship with Wembley. Mm. Scored, I thought, particularly, was it 1990? 1991. 91. Yeah. Was it Gaza, the injury? Yeah. Yeah. Nottingham Forest, Gary Charles. Talk to me about that day. It was the one trophy Cluffy had never won, Joe. You really? know, so for us as a new generation of, yeah. of Forest players, we were desperate to deliver that trophy for yeah. him that he'd never yeah. got his hands on. So it was, it was a really big one for us. And to be fair, Gaza, Gaza's gone into the game for the first 15 minutes. He, he made two of the worst challenges you've ever seen. How he never got sent off, we'll never yeah. know. But yeah. He was one player that you know in their ranks they had Lineker up front, but they've yeah. got Gazza in midfield. So you've got two yeah. top quality players. One can get yeah. you a goal, the other one can win a game at yeah. the drop of a hat. And yeah. To be fair, we were delighted to see him go off. Mm. I, obviously, he didn't want a long-term injury with him, but mm. he went off. We scored from the subsequent free kick. And, and to be fair, I would say, looking back at the game now, Joe, from that moment mm. on, we didn't play. We just held mm. on to it or tried to hold on to a lead. Mm. and. It, it wasn't a great game and in the end it ended up fizzling out and it wasn't to be for us mm. on that day, but we didn't play well enough on that yeah. day and, and Spurs probably got a lift from Gaza yeah. going off in many ways. Sometimes it's the siege mentality, mm. you know, he sticks in and anyway. So you, your, your career at Nottingham Forest, it ends relegation. Mm. I mean, I've suffered relegation in my career and at a club that I love, West Ham. It must have been really, t really tough mm. for you for it to end that way. It, it, it was a tough, yeah. it was very tough. That whole season was, was awful for us. We mm. were destined to go down from start to finish. Yeah. People saying that we're too good to go down. Yeah. That wasn't the case. In, in the subsequent year or two beforehand, we'd sold Des Walker, yeah. Neil Webb had gone, Roy Keane had gone, Nigel yeah. Clough had gone. So too many good players had walked yeah. out the door. Why, why was that? What? Um, Listen, when, when you get the opportunity to join Manchester United or mm. the bigger teams at the time with, with Roy's opportunity yeah. and, and one or two others, a lot of people jumped at that. Yeah. I mean, I was probably one of the ones that enjoyed where I was working mm. and, and turned down opportunities to go to bigger mm. clubs because yeah. I, I, I was enjoying my football, I enjoyed yeah. where I lived and worked. Yeah. And um, did, the did, club had been good to me. Did you have opportunities? There must have been opportunities to go. Yeah, probably the two big ones for me were, were Rangers in Scotland when yeah. they were paying big money and Suey yeah. was in charge and yeah. um, Manchester United wow. uh, in about 1990, I think it was. But at the time at Forest, we were winning more than they were. And more importantly for Joe, uh, for me, Joe, I was, I was playing for England and and that meant more to me than anything. Mm. And I've seen too many of our players leave Forest, Gary Burtles, and go to Man United or go mm. to other clubs and their form dip. And I, yeah. I, I weren't prepared to let yeah. that happen to me. You went up to Newcastle and you played with the likes of John Barnes, Ian mm. Rush. Well, and I think Kenny was the manager at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how was that? I mean, you had a hell of a team up there as well. I, I walked in the dressing room, Joe, yeah. and Les Ferdinand, Alan Shearer, wow. Asprilla, yeah. Beardsley, well, you name it, David Batty, Rob Lee, a host of, of, yeah. of top, top quality players were in the dressing room and they had just finished second in the league the year before. So the opportunity for me to go and join them w was just incredible, mm. you know. So, um, it, yeah, as I say, they were in the Champions League, so it's yeah. Champions League football that, that yeah. I hadn't played in. Um, so it was a fantastic opportunity for me at the right age and yeah. at the right time, I think, to leave yeah. Forest at the time, you know. You had the taste of the Champions League, the FA Cup final again in 98 mm. against the great Arsenal side with the young Nicholas Anelka and yeah. that. I mean, you, you, the FA Cup was the one that got away from mm. it because it's so important for, I say our generation, you're older than me, but it, for me, yeah. the FA Cup was the one trophy that I, I wanted to win, even more so than the Champions League. Yeah. But, I mean, 
uh, that day, was it two? Was it two nil? Yeah, yeah. We were well beaten by Arsenal mm. on that. I've got to say. I mean, I was probably fortunate in some ways. The two mm. years I was at Newcastle, they they got to the uh, yeah. final on both occasions. Yeah, you yeah. know, which was good. The second year, I didn't contribute a great deal to that, but mm. the first year certainly did. And yeah, it was it was. I think when you're born in, probably when I was, the FA Cup has got real glitz mm. to it, you know, and, and to have the opportunity. But Arsenal had an outstanding team, you know, and yeah. it had all the superstars, the Invincibles yeah. and whatever, and they were by, by far better than us on yeah. the day. It, it was a tough one to swallow, I've got yeah. to say. You know, you think you've let your country down, mm. and when we arrived back in Luton, the, the rest of the squad were all quite buoyant, you know, mm. and thought they'd done reasonably well and that type mm. of thing. And myself and Chrissy were sort of just wanted to go home under a cloud yeah. and start the season again with our club. So he gets to 99, our paths cross, and I think, you know, it was exciting for me as a young player mm. when you come in. We played against Tottenham in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup, yeah. and you had an ankle injury, and you, I think Harry was like, well, Pierce, he's not going to play because you're, it was blown up like that. Mm. And you come into the dressing room and you put your ankle out. And I must say, it was the ugliest ankle I've ever seen. It was swollen, like, it looked like the elef elephant man's ankle. And you just went, just cut me boots and inject it and play. And I was, I, I, I couldn't believe it. It was black and blue. I said to John Green, the physio, I said, what chance have I got of getting through the mm. game? I said, I don't like strappings. He said, yeah. if you don't strap this, you'll yeah. never, ever get through the game. Yeah. So I said, all right, do it. I've got through the game, but he said, we're going to have to change it at half-time because yeah. if there's any leeway at all, yeah. you're done. Yeah, yeah. So I come in at half-time and uh, Jess Steinberg's the, uh, the, the yeah. doc, yeah. put his scissors inside the strapping. It was so tight, Joe, he thought he was putting his scissors inside the strapping. He was actually trying to put it inside my skin to cut... <laughs> To cut it off, it was that tight. So in the end, he's got it off. We've re-strapped it again and managed yeah. to get through the game. But it, it was one of those that it was touch and go. The West Ham fans fondly remember you from your playing. Although you was your 37, you carried on going again mm. to Manchester City. 2001, you dropped down the league. Yeah. And then you ended up winning the title with them. And what, you must have been 39 or 38, Pierce. You meant to, mm. Was there opportunities to carry on after that? Or was you, was you done? Um... Well, Harry, Harry, had, uh, Harry Redknapp had left uh, West Ham. I was 39 yes. years old. My contract wow. had finished. And Kevin Keegan rang me and wow. said, uh, I've just got the Manchester City job. Mm. Um, you're going to be my first signing. I want you to come in uh, as the captain, mm. first signing. And I said to him, look, I'm looking to go into management and coaching. He said, well, you can be a coach as well. You can do that Perfect. here while you're playing. So I said, OK. So off I went from thinking I'm going to retire Mm. I went up to Manchester City and had, had an absolute incredible year with Kevin, you yeah. know, fantastic man. Uh, and we won the division with 100 plus points and it was just a brilliant way of yeah. bailing out. We got promoted back into the Premier League and for me that was probably the time I physically could have gone on. Yeah. But with the likes of Anelka waiting for you in the Premier League, yeah, it was probably wise yeah. to step away and, uh, and stayed on the coaching staff yeah. there. That's incredible. I mean, incredible journey, but it's, we can't have you on here without talking about England. 1990, the, the, that was the tournament. I was sitting there as a nine-year-old, mm. and I remember, again, Gaza, and watching yourself. I fell in love with, with football and mm. realised that's what I wanted. I want to play for England. So yeah. you, talk to me about that tournament. Yeah, when I, when I look back now, Joe, it was almost the gateway <coughs> between what football was like before yeah. that, you know? Yeah, yeah, It yeah. was just you know, certain people used to go out of football. And then mm. all of a sudden, after 1990, it became popular to the masses. And probably you've got to look at the likes, mm. you know, Des Walker come on the mm. scene then, Platty come on the scene then, and more importantly, Gaza. You mm. know, Gaza with his personality, with his performances, yeah. with everything that went with him. And I, I was seeing myself really fortunate that, mm. that my time went hand in hand with Gaza's time yeah. in the England team, you know. Um, for me, apart from Bobby Charlton, he, he's been the best we've ever had, you yeah. know. So um, it was brilliant. A great tournament and my first and only World Cup. It, it was just incredible. We come back to Luton, there was a quarter of a million people yeah. lying in the streets to welcome us back, you yeah, know. Yeah. And a lot of that was down to Gaza and yeah. how he, he grabbed, grabbed yeah. everyone. We've got to talk about 
the penalty. Mm. Just made my mind up, Joe, mm. really, just to go down the middle with, with some pace and hammer, yeah. you know, and, and the goalie, credit to him, done, you know, yeah. kept his feet there and, and got in the way of it, and they took some fantastic penalties. Yeah. But where I always find that, and, and I always try to do this in life, if you get a bit of adversity somewhere, you've got to look and say there's a plus in there somewhere. Mm. I, I got pulled in for a drugs test, me and Schiltz, uh, yeah. with the England, I walked in having missed a penalty, which was the lowest moment of my career ever, and mm. walked into a room, two German players sat down, mm. and myself and Schiltz, Schiltz walked in, uh, give a urine sample and walked out again. Mm. And just myself and two German players sat in a room like you and I yeah. across. They didn't say a word to each other for about an hour and a half. Neither of us could give a sample mm. for that length of time. Yeah. We had to keep drinking water. And they didn't say a word. And subsequently afterwards, I thought, well, what would this have looked like if yeah. it was two England players who had just won a semi and one German? Yeah. You know? And I thought, yeah. that's how to be humble in success. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. it really taught me a big lesson yeah. that day. It, it was a tough one to swallow, I've got yeah. to say. You know, you think you've let your country down. Mm. And when we arrived back in Luton, the, the rest of the squad were all quite buoyant, you know, mm. and thought they'd done reasonably well and that type mm. of thing. And myself and Chrissy were sort of just wanted to go home under a cloud yeah. and start the season again with our clubs. And yeah. that was the following season was, was my best season as a player because yeah. every ground I went to, I got dogs abuse, Joe. Right. Which really inspired yeah. me. Yeah. And you talk about, mm. you know, redemption. 96 rolls around again. Another one that sticks in my mind. Another, another massive moment. I think a lot of those people in the stadium that day had been on the same journey as me. Yeah. So when the ball was put on the penalty spot and, mm. and I was walking up to take a penalty, you could feel the tension around the stadium. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was nervous, make yeah. no mistake, you always are. But I had a feeling that the relief when the ball hit the back of the net was felt by yeah. everybody that was supporting yeah. England in the stadium that day, you know? It was yeah. as though, thank goodness he scored and not missed, you yeah. know? And, but the big thing for me, Joe, was I knew that there was no defined taking order. You knew Shearer was going to take a penalty and, and yeah. maybe Teddy, but apart from that, there was no talk of who's taking a penalty or what. Yeah. And I knew that I had to get to Terry, uh, and the manager, and say, I'm going to take the third penalty. Mm. And, and what was his reaction? Are you sure? It was the first <laughs> thing he said. I went up to him and said, oh, yeah. I'm taking number three. And he just looked yeah. at me and went, are you sure? There was really? an expletive in there as well, Joe, but <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah. I've distanced myself from that, yeah. yeah. And I went, yeah, I am. Well, I was yeah. before you said that, you know, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. there we were. So I look now and, and you talk about, I, I speak with companies about adversity and stuff mm. like that. And I always think that it, it's the not trying or not putting yourself up. Whether you're mm. successful or not, in some ways, is a little bit irrelevant. And that's yeah. sort of how I looked at it. I thought, yeah. if, if I stand on the halfway line and send Incy up or, yeah, yeah. or, or Tony Adams or whatever, yeah. players that are not penalty takers, yeah. And for me to stand on the halfway yeah. line, I probably couldn't live with myself, Joe, yes. to be honest. You're a legend of the game for England. You've hung your boots up. And, you know, if people would have said you've gone in straight into coaching. You went in there and you went in City during a transitional period of the mm. club. I mean, how was that with your coaching career? I had a, a mentality that said, I'm going to leave no stone unturned to be as good as mm. I possibly can. So from, from doing every coaching badge that was available to going to one of the inaugural uh, Warwick Business School, uh, yeah. business studies, from learning Italian, working with Fabio, from yeah. going to psychology courses and whatever, yeah. I'd go on every course available to me. Yeah. Because I, I just had that mentality, I've got to start again in a new mm. career and prove myself. And yeah. I was really fortunate. I had a good chairman at Manchester City. and. He was fantastic with me. Mm. He said, come in, come into the board meetings, learn how it is. I used to go in with a chief, chief exec, Alistair yeah. McIntosh, in the afternoons and, yeah. and go through the business side of Manchester City. So I knew when I took over as manager, mm. I knew the club were in financial ruin, to yeah. be honest with you. But it was fantastic to work with the players there. We were mm. managing the books a little bit. Yeah. I think in the two and a, two and a half years I managed mm. Manchester City, we ended up recouping £13 million mm. rather than spending the big money. Inevitably, you end your career in, goes full circle back with England. You take over the England job in 2007. Mm. You had some great players. You had Mark Noble, James Milner, mm. and you, you had a lot of success. I mean, did you feel that was 
going back to work for the FA in England, do you feel that was your most comfortable? I was most probably happy. the most proudest. Proudest, I would yeah. say. One of the most proudest, yeah. I've got to say. I was fortunate that during the last six months of my tenure at Manchester yeah. City, Trevor Brook in the FA come, come to me and said, we need someone to take the under-21s to the finals that they've right. qualified for this summer. So I said yes before Manchester City had opportunity to say no, right. if okay. truth be known. Right, so okay. I was doing both jobs. Right, I was okay. managing Manchester City, but also prepping the under-21s. So at the end of that season, um, mm. I ended up losing my job at Manchester City mm -hmm. when the new owners come in because they wanted uh, yeah. Sven Goran going in to take over Manchester City, so which was fine. And I concentrated on the under 21s and had six brilliant years at yeah. four major tournaments, which was fantastic for me. As you say, you're working with the best players in the country, you've got the yeah. best facilities in the country. I used it as well to improve myself as a coach and manager. I mm. used to go in all the clubs and watch training and meet the managers and yeah. that type of thing. And it was just a wonderful learning curve, mm. really, for me, and, and a very proud moment because I, I knew what it meant for me to play mm. for England. You also managed the Great Britain team, mm. 2012. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a... Ma you must have been so proud there. The one thing I would say, Joe, is, is when we turned up as a group, as a mm. squad, to be part of this massive worldwide umbrella, it was incredible. Yeah. Honestly, it was... For me, it was bigger than a World Cup really? as a player, 100%. You just felt as though you were showcasing your sport in, yeah. a, in a sport, in a worldwide event, if yeah, you like. Yeah. It was incredible to be involved yeah. in. So you stepped away from West Ham. Mm. What, does, you know, what does the future hold? I certainly not stepped away from, from West Ham to say that I'm never going to be involved in football again. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy trying to improve young players. I, yeah. You know, so... If I have opportunities to go and do that type of thing or something that excites me, I'll certainly do that. But I also enjoy bits and pieces like yeah. this. I enjoy the media. Yeah. I go into companies. I do a lot of leadership, motivational yeah. speaking, which I really enjoy as well. So having a mm. mixed bag of different things, yeah. I quite enjoy, Joe. Right, quick fire questions, Percy. Your favourite goal you've ever scored? Uh, diving header at Peterborough. Yeah for Nottingham Forest, got us promoted back into the Premier League and a year before that I decided to, as England captain, to yeah. stay with Nottingham Forest and not yeah. leave them. So it symbolised a great deal for me and the fans. Yeah. It wasn't and a great goal, but it symbolised something. Yeah, well, listen, diving headers going out of fashion, you don't see them anymore, do you? Yeah, especially with my bonnet as well, <laughs> fella, you know. If you could go back to relive any moment in your career, what would it be? Um, I would be on a penalty spot in Turin and stick it in one of the corners <laughs> when the German goalkeeper left his uh, legs there. Best atmosphere you've ever played in? Euro 96 for England. I concur. I was in the crowd. Mm. Best player you've ever played with? Paul Gascoigne. Most yeah. consistent Des Walker, but the best Paul Gascoigne. Well, Piers, it's been brilliant chatting to you. You know, you've always, you'll always be an England legend. Piercey. Cheers, Joe. Good to see you, buddy. And you, pal. Sport Pods.